it was not really until the climax of the space race that the U.S. gained the upper hand against the USSR in space exploration. When Neil Armstrong landed on the moon in 1969, America was finally regarded as the victor. Nonetheless, the USSR was ready to retaliate through the KGB and began a more unconventional campaign to make sure it wasn't going to be left behind. The Soviets enlisted hundreds of spies that successfully obtained both classified and public intelligence related to the American space program. Thanks to its clandestine efforts, the Soviet Union was able to steal the first U.S. shuttle design during an operation that took place in the late 70s and early 80s. The Russians called their carbon copy space shuttle the Buran, or Blizzard. This is an intriguing tale of the competition between the Cold War's two great powers, filled with politics, paranoia, war, and what historians have called the first recorded case of online spying. The year was 1974. The Vietnam War was about to end. The U.S. forces were ready to leave Indochina as the Viet Cong slowly took over the Democratic South. In the Korean demilitarized zone, tensions rose as the U.S. slowly began to lose influence over the region. Nonetheless, America was winning the Cold War on another front, better known as the Space Race. On par with its military expansion, the country rapidly was taking over space, and the USSR couldn't keep up. A state of paranoia loomed over the Kremlin. The constant fear of being bombed from the sky by secret US aircraft threatened Moscow's security. During the last months of 1974, a secret meeting took place in the Kremlin with the USSR's top tier officials. Vladimir Smirnov, head of the Military Industrial Commission, or VPK, tasked with directing military projects and laying strategies for obtaining new technologies, briefed 70-year-old Soviet leader Leonid Brezhnev on next year's priorities. After discussing the routine matters related to the motherland, Smirnov's tone suddenly changed and turned grave. According to a report written by Robert Windrum for NBC News, Smirnov told Brezhnev, quote, The Americans are intensively working on a winged space vehicle. Such a vehicle is like an aircraft. It is capable through a side maneuver of changing its orbit in such a way that it would find itself at the right moment right over Moscow, possibly with dangerous cargo. Although the American shuttle program had not been designed to support weaponry, Smirnov and other high-ranking officers believed that the U.S. was working on a space bomber capable of threatening Moscow with nuclear weapons. Smirnov's intel suggested that the U.S. shuttle had a 30-ton payload to orbit capacity and a 15-ton payload return capacity. For him, that was a clear indication that their enemy was testing and placing laser weapons into orbit to destroy enemy missiles. Marshal Dmitry Ustinov, a veteran from World War II and member of the Presidium in charge of the USSR's defense, was convinced by Smirnov's words and urged the Soviet leader to take action. If the US was building a space bomber, Ustinov concluded, then so should the USSR. Even though the Russian officers greatly exaggerated the threat, they succeeded in alarming Brezhnev into securing the funds required to build an aircraft similar to their American counterparts. Once Smirnov finished his report, Soviet leader Brezhnev said, quote, We are not country bumpkins here. Let us make an effort and find the money. Worried about the secret American superweapon, Brezhnev immediately ordered his closest officers to collect the colossal amount of money required to gain the upper hand against their American counterparts. 
based on NBC's 1997 investigation. A Russian journalist would later write, quote, They began to use the shuttle to frighten Leonid Ilyich Brezhnev, and they explained to him that damn shuttle could zoom down on Moscow in any minute, bomb it to smithereens, and fly away. Brezhnev understood. Yes, of course. An alternative weapon is necessary. According to Windrum's NBC report, not all Soviet leaders had been convinced by the American space shuttle's threat. One of them was Marshal Georgi Grechko, the Minister of Defense, who was turned off by the large amount of money required to build a Soviet aircraft of similar characteristics. However, Brezhnev's fear was understandable. Like any other weapon created by either superpower, there had to be a counterpart to change the tide. That was the whole point of why the arms race took place, and why there was never a direct confrontation between both powers. A theory of mutual destruction made the US and the Soviet Union think twice before making a move. Intercontinental ballistic missiles were not a subject to mess around with. If the USSR built a shuttle of its own, the US would be forced to take a defensive stance. In February 1976, the project was authorized by the Communist Party's Central Committee and the Soviet Council of Ministers. The USSR would attempt to shift the balance of the Cold War. Colonel General Alexander Maximov, who ran military space and missile programs, was tasked with the shuttle's development. There was, however, one problem. Although the USSR's most intelligent men were part of the space program, the country still fell behind the US in terms of technology development. The Soviets were some decades behind the Americans, and instead of building their own space plane from the ground up, the Soviets decided to catch up with the help of the KGB and the VPK. Yuri Semenov, one of the developers of the Energia booster program that the new space shuttle would use, said, quote, it was said at meetings on various levels that American shuttles, even on the first revolution, could perform a lateral maneuver and turn to be over Moscow, possibly with dangerous cargo. Parity is needed. We needed the same type of rocket space system. The Soviet Union had to build a space shuttle fast. There was no time for experiments. Consequently, the USSR decided to ditch a program created back in the 1960s to make a reusable space plane. This new effort was dubbed the Spiral Program. Russian engineers thought they could restore their old project to build a new spacecraft, but it was promptly rejected. Authorities at the VPK and the KGB came up with a new plan. By stealing information from the American space program, the USSR would save money and time. So the VPK got to work to gather the materials and the technology required to build a space shuttle. At first, Soviet spies would simply leave the Soviet embassy and purchase copies of public documents from the government printing office. Soviet intel was surprised to discover that the US had decided not to classify its program. All the info that went into the American Enterprise program in 1972 was open to the public. The U.S. knew that the VPK was in the technology transfer business since the early 60s. Still, it did not know about the massive amounts of money the USSR spent on espionage to steal U.S. info. Almost half a million rubles, the equivalent of roughly $140,000 at that time, was dedicated to gathering intel related to the U.S. Shuttle Orbiter Control System. According to a study by the CIA, research centers such as Caltech, MIT, Brooklyn Poly, Princeton, Stanford, Kansas, Penn State, and others were also closely monitored by the KGB to gain info. 
once the CIA and the NSA discovered what the Soviets were doing, it was too late to retaliate. The KGB had already hacked many computers to transfer thousands of documents from government agencies and universities. In his article, Windrum wrote, quote, The massive effort directed at the U.S. space shuttle program was among the first cases of internet espionage, if not the first case. Soviet interest in NASA activities focused on everything. The USSR acquired everything needed to build their aircraft from materials and components for airframe designs and propulsion systems. The NSA later discovered that the Soviets used Vienna and Helsinki's research centers as covers to send the intel to Moscow. Under President Reagan's administration, the CIA concluded that most of the information stolen went directly to the Chamber of Commerce and Industry in Moscow. By the time the U.S. launched the Space Shuttle Columbia in 1981, more than 3,500 documents related to the American space program were online. These included shuttle wind tunnel tests, booster rockets, the shuttle's computers, and its military applications. CIA and NSA officials told news outlets that the USSR's shuttle program saved billions of dollars and decades of research by using online spying. When interviewed by NBC News, Edward Aldridge, Secretary of the Air Force during the Reagan administration, said, quote, they didn't have to put their orbiters through all the wind tunnel tests and computer simulations we did because our test data was available to them. The Russian copycat space shuttle, Buran, only completed two orbits in 1988. During a space display at the Baikonur Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan, it suffered severe damage after the roof housing collapsed. The shuttle was never repaired. One year later, the Berlin Wall fell, and the USSR swiftly dissolved. Some parts of the copycat are currently displayed in various museums across Russia. The Buran looked almost the same as the US shuttle. However, technically, the Russian spacecraft was far more powerful and reliable thanks to the Energia program. While the U.S. shuttle required two boosters to assist the main engines to get into space, the Buran was strapped to the Energia, a heavy lifting rocket that required an extra four external liquid-fueled boosters. Another feature that the Buran had and the U.S. shuttle lacked were ejection seats. Unintentionally, the Buran copycat space shuttle laid the foundation for future American and Russian system compatibility. From 1995 on, U.S. space shuttles started linking up to Russia's Mir space station with little modifications. In 